Welcome to the Center for Spiritual Living, where we are absolutely convinced that life is good because we understand, Janelle, what do we understand? There's only one power and one presence in the universe. I hope all of our glasses are holding together well. It's good not to sit on the glasses. Don't sit on the glasses. Glad that you're here. We have practitioners who are anchoring this service in prayer, so we are thankful for that. The reading for today is by Ernest Holmes. It is from 10 Ideas That Make a Difference. Unity doesn't mean uniformity. Different thoughts and ideas are inherent to the nature of life. We need this variety. But back of it all, we need a sympathetic understanding of others. Have we kindness for each other? Are we flexible enough to know that everyone does not have to think alike in order to live harmoniously? Are we able to reach across all differences of opinion to the common ground upon which we all stand? Well, you know, thoughts are funny things. We live inside of them. They live inside of us. And we collect them. Some people collect butterflies, but all of us collect thoughts. And when we accumulate our thoughts, they tend to cluster like grapes on a vine. They cluster together. They form categories. They form thought platforms from which we launch our lives and we live from. We live on those thoughts. They create systems. And systems are like a pair of glasses. We put them on so we can see the world through our thoughts. We, of course, pretty quickly forget that we even have glasses on. And so we think that's just the way the world is. Every decision we make, every interpretation, every reaction grows out of that thought system that we carry within us. And your thought system actually sustains itself. If something comes to uh, imply that the thoughts aren't right, the thought system quickly gets rid of it. If something comes in and says the thoughts are right, we accept it with joy. And so within your worldview, there are beliefs, there are expectations for life and for other people, opinions, points of view. We live inside of our thoughts and our thoughts live inside of us. And when you live from your thoughts, you make habitual decisions. You may look at life just like you did a year ago or five years ago. So we keep repeating the same idea because we're operating from the same kinds of thoughts. And anyone that disagrees with us, we simply judge them as wrong because we know that our perspective is, after all, right. We have a psychological mechanism so that we protect those thoughts under lock and key most of the time. So many times we don't even know what the thoughts are and what the beliefs might be. And if someone does validate them, it even deepens their hold on us until life eventually comes and knocks us out of the box. And most of the time, life does knock us out of the box. Now, you don't have to wait till life knocks you out of the box. You can begin to come out of your box on your own. And you do that by talking about what we're talking about when we talk about thoughts and perceptions and perspectives and realize that we each have our own and they may not agree in a lot of areas. Just talking about it and thinking about it can make a big difference. And it helps us to begin to respect and value the perspectives that other people may have. And when that begins to happen, one thing that can help us move forward is the idea that we don't have to be right every time. That I could have a perspective, and you may have one, and both of us could be right because there is no reality. There's only perception most of the time. And so these thought systems are important. We live inside of them and they live inside of us. And it's only when we begin to realize that, only when we begin to value the perception and perspective of other people, can we really listen 
to another person. Otherwise, we're, we may pretend we're listening, but we're still steeped in our own perspective. So it's a beautiful thing when we come out of that box so that we can begin to hear what other people might be saying. And at that point, even criticism doesn't bother us so much because we understand criticism is just a thought, just like praise is just a thought. I suppose Shakespeare was right when he said there's nothing either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Because it always comes back to the thoughts. And so that's why beauty is always in the eye of the beholder. It really is. A psychologist had come to visit a school system. And he was walking with the principal through the hall and he came around the corner and there were two boys pressed up against the locker and one boy was hitting the other boy in the head with his fist. So the principal grabbed the boys up, took them to his office, and once they calmed down, he asked them, John, why were you hitting Brian like that? And he said, I quote, I couldn't think of anything else to do. <laughs> and that is a grand statement. Because how much of our suffering and how much of our misery is caused because I couldn't think of anything else to do. And that's because we do live in that box. It's because we do live on that thought platform. And our thought platform often is very small. And so sometimes we can't think beyond it. And so we don't really know what to do. And we end up feeling quite stuck. So probably at one time or the other, you've wished for more options. You wish that the thought forms that you were standing on would grow so at least you had more choice. Ernest Holmes said, change your thinking and you change your life. And so that's the real key. The real key is to be able to expand and change your thinking because then your life really does change. And that's what enables you to step out of the procession and be able to be free, be able to make some real decisions based on the broader, broader perspective. Expanding consciousness is what we call it, and, and that's what it's all about. So every one of us has our own world, and I know you've heard that, but it's so, so amazingly true that each one of us, we see the world through our eyes, and it makes a huge difference. You can see it with children and parents. The parent says, clean the room, and he or she comes back in an hour and announces the room is now clean. And the parent goes and they look in the room and they say, yeah, man, it's not clean at all. <laughs> and so it just shows that we have different perspectives. We have different eyes. Relationships between partners often get in trouble because the people have different perspectives and they don't really bother to find out what the other perspective is. They simply know their idea is right and the other person has to be wrong because, after all, they're right. I can give you a real example of that and the example deals with trash the man felt that taking the trash out would be a good thing for him to do. He didn't think it was his duty exactly, but he thought it was a nice thing to do, and so he informed his uh, partner that he would be taking the trash out. And for her, it was an absolute act of love. It wasn't just doing something to be nice, but for her it meant my husband loves me and cares about me. And so on the day that he forgot to take the trash out, as he pulled out of the driveway, he thought, I forgot, but it's no big deal. I'll take it out tonight or maybe even in the morning. No big deal. She was really upset. And she was upset because for her, it really meant something big. It meant he didn't love her. And that's exactly what she felt. Now, it doesn't really do any good to talk about who's right or who's wrong because in that situation, there's not a right or wrong. There's no reality. There's just perception. And so perception is important. In relationships, if you don't really know, or at least have some clue what the other person might be thinking, then it's probably doomed not to work very well. And so what is life about? We could interview people and ask people, and everybody would give a different answer. Someone might say, life is a bowl of cherries. I like cherries. Someone else might say, life is the pits. And so we speak always from our own perspective. And so it really depends. Everybody has their own thought platform they operate from. 
I walk a lot around the lake. We live near Lake Lynn, and so we can just walk over and start walking around the lake. And I was walking around it one day, and as I came around the corner, there was a hawk on the path. Of course, I stopped. It wasn't eating anything. It wasn't injured. It was just sort of hanging out on the path. No one was around except the people on the other side of the hawk. And there was a woman and a little girl. I would guess the little girl was probably about four, five years old. And it was one of those moments. It was one of those moments. And I smiled. And I wasn't smiling at the hawk or the woman. But I was smiling at the little girl because the little girl was so excited. And you could see a sense of mystery in her eyes because something magical was happening. Something sacred was happening in that little girl's mind and because of what she said she whispered to me across the way I knew that she wanted me to share the same experience and I did because she was like a, an up-and-coming angel sprinkling stardust all around me and just pulled me right into the wonder that she was feeling into so the hawk the little girl and me there was a lake there were trees a, a asphalt pathway all of that and nothing really changed but something changed inside of me because of the situation because of the little girl all of us had come from the same earth and all of us had come together and we rendezvoused exactly at that situation so we could share that experience even after the hawk flew away and they continued on their journey and I continued on mine I found myself still smiling as I walked around the lake just thinking about really thinking about her eyes and the excitement that she felt. You know, you and I can do that. What made it so special was I was able to look through her eyes. And we have the gift of multiple vision because all of us can look through the eyes of another person. All of us have the ability to look through and see the perspective of another person. We even have mirror neurons in our brain that can help us do exactly that. We can see life through the eyes of love. Or we can see life through the eyes of boredom. It's our choice. Or like Einstein, we could see through the eyes of miracles. And he said everything in life was a miracle. And so when you think about life, when you see life, when you are living life, what does it look like to you? What does it feel like to you? I'd like to be able to experience spiritual eyes every day. I'd like to live that way every moment. We know spirituality is not a noun. It's not something you go to the store and buy and you put in the cabinet and anytime you need some of it, you pull it out and drink it or eat it. It's not a thing. We used to say that it's a verb. It's something you do. But it's far more than just a verb. It may be an adverb. Maybe an adjective. I'm not sure. But it is an experience that happens. You might be doing something and it might come and you might be doing the same thing later and it doesn't come at all. And so it's something that is somewhat mystical, I believe. It's a quality that we experience. I've walked around that lake many times. And sometimes, most of the time, there's no magic. I've stopped and watched animals there. I've seen deer and I've seen other animals. Am I being, uh, am I on camera? I didn't see anybody so I thought I could move. I may move back. And so, I, I've stopped and I've watched, you know, all kinds of birds and I've watched deer and I've watched rabbit and, and hawks and other things. And yet still no magic, no luminosity. And if spirituality were just a thing that I could, you know, I could go over there and do something and feel it, of course I would, but it's not really like that. I suspect that most of us have had spiritual experiences at normal, ordinary times. Maybe you're off, you have a lunch break and then something occurs. Maybe a certain song comes on the radio. Maybe you're lying underneath the stars, or maybe you're driving your car. Maybe you're watching children play. But something happens, and the ordinary becomes sacred. 
But on the other hand, sometimes we're doing things that are supposed to be sacred. Maybe meditation, maybe prayer, maybe here on a Sunday morning. And we don't feel anything spiritual much at all. And so it's not something that you can just pin down as an activity. And that's going to give it to you because you may end up feeling sort of un, uh, inspired regardless of what's happening. So the question is, how do we cultivate that spiritual experience? How do we cultivate it? How do we turn it on? Now, I'm a big fan of formal spiritual practice. The reason is because if I don't calendarize something, then it may never happen. If I don't calendarize meditation or prayer or walking around a lake or something, then the day can move by and I may not do it. But the thing about making uh, spiritual practice formal is it's almost as if I do my formal practice over here and then real life, ordinary life, is over here. And so I'm almost treating it like a noun, like a thing. So I do my spiritual thing and then I go do my ordinary life. It, it's much better when we can blend it all together. So how could we do that? How could we cultivate that kind of spiritual thing? We do lots of ordinary things. We work we eat, we raise our kids, we talk to our family, we talk to friends, we vote, we think. We do all kinds of ordinary things. The quality with which we bring to those activities is seeded with spirituality because it's all around us all the time. It's like the song that Karen and I sang last week, everything is holy now. Everything is holy now. And so spiritual qualities can be a part of everything. And if we begin to move in that direction, it radically changes our lives. Radically. It all depends on you. And it, for me, it all depends on me. It depends on my eyes. It depends on how I look at life. It depends on how I look at people and look at situations. When you see it as something that's possibly embedded in every single thing that happens, it makes life much richer. We say every Sunday, God is everywhere in its fullness. But just because we have the potential of kindness, just because we have the potential of generosity, the potential of feeling spiritual, doesn't always mean that we manifest it. So I want to talk about how to cultivate it. I want to talk about how to cultivate it and make it part of our lives all the time. A friend of mine, Doug Kraft, talked, gave a talk some time ago, and he called the talk Spiritual Eyes. And he suggested that spiritual eyes is a practice. It's a practice that helps bring this kind of quality to everything in life. And it helps deepen it in ourselves every day. And the practice is very simple. Just, he said, just shift how you look at the world around you. Simple as that. It uses the, the spiritual faculty of imagination. And so you simply shift how you look at the world. The little girl and the hawk triggered that for me. And they allowed that to happen. Now, nothing changed. The lake was still the same. The trees were still the same. The path was still the same. But my consciousness was flipped into a different mode. And it was flipped because of the catalyst of the little girl and the hawk. We can look at the world with eyes of cynicism. And we can find all kinds of hypocrites and people that we're not happy about. We can look at the world through eyes of need. And we can focus on all the things that we have missing in our lives and wish somebody would come and meet our needs. We can look at life and look at the world through eyes of annoyance. And when we do that, we can pick out all the stupid and irritating things people do every day. We can look at the world through eyes of fear. And we will see threats and potential threats everywhere. We can look at eyes of play, we'd have a lot more fun. We can look through eyes of love, eyes of wonder, eyes of joy. We could look at life through spiritual eyes and we would find the magic of life. We would find the, uh, the awe in, 
inspiration, the goodness in life, the magic is always there if we but have eyes to see. And the good news is there's nothing you have to do first. You don't have to take a class. You don't have to pay me 19.95. You uh, don't have to climb a spiritual ladder and reach a certain level before you can have spiritual eyes. There's no prerequisite for it. It's not a multi-stage path and you have to go through these stages. You don't have to earn certain belts in order to simply do it. You could do it right now. You could wake up in the morning and do it. You could take a look right now and go ahead and do that. Nobody will mind if you're looking at them. Just look around and look through spiritual eyes and see the beauty that's just in this room, the wonder that's in this room. Now, I know our minds have kind of a, an inertia because, after all, I've been thinking a certain way all my life. Don't, be try to change, don't go try to change how I'm looking at life. But, you know, that inertia can let go if we really do want to expand our vision. It wouldn't be me if I didn't give you some tips, and so let me give you some. And the tips, because I always need tips myself, and so let me give you some brief tips on how to cultivate this quality. Tip number one is this. Remember, this is not going to damage your psyche. This practice is not going to force you to change your political affiliation. It's not going to cause you to vote for, and I'm not going to mention a name. It doesn't demand that you join any religion. This practice simply invites you to imagine, and all of you have that faculty, to imagine the world through sacred eyes for just a few minutes. And then you can go back to the old way. Simple as that. Tip two. It might not enlighten you. And so don't expect permanent change. Now, it could change you forever. It could radically transform you, and you might be enlightened. Could happen, but it might not. And so if the old habits pop up again, it's no problem at all. It's okay. And then number three, I'd like for you to recall as a tip recall a time that you were delighted with life. And so you go back in your memory. A Native American might say, go back into your coup. Your coup is the storehouse where you have all your memories stored. And so you go back into your memory and you find maybe something even from childhood when you felt such magic with life and nature and, and people and maybe with yourself. And you go back and you find that because when you do that, it's much easier to flip into spiritual eye consciousness because you're coming from that imaginational place. When I think of the little girl standing there looking at the hawk and she whispered to me carefully and she said, look at that. And I'm not sure why. I get chills hearing those words. Because she understood you have to look. Look at that big bird. And you see how that could make it easier for me to slip into that consciousness. Tip four. Draw on some of your heroes. If Jesus happens to be a hero, then imagine looking at life, looking at a person through his eyes. Or through the eyes of Buddha or through the eyes of Mother Teresa, or black elk. Maybe a mother or father, a brother or sister, a friend, a teacher, someone that you know how they would look at life, and you can begin to imagine looking at life through their eyes, and transformation happens. It does. Tip five, practice impossible thoughts. I believe it was the Red Queen in Through the Looking Glass who said, you should at least practice or have three impossible thoughts before breakfast every day, at least. Because when you open up to impossible thoughts, it helps you slip over to that higher consciousness. It's easier to do. And so when you wake up in the morning, just imagine chocolate floating in, uh, above your head, uh, uh, in the air, above your bed, and you can just reach up and take one. Just imagine. Imagine you go into the bathroom in the morning and there's a cow in the sink taking a bath and you just look at that. 
What you want to do is just imagine wild and unbelievable things, and then you can slip and put your spiritual glasses on. You can do something out of character. If you're really neat, be a slob for a day. Because just getting out of that rut, getting out of that pattern will change things. If you're always rushing, then take a day and just slow down and breathe. You want to just break the pattern. You can pick up the toothpaste tube and, and just squeeze it in the middle and say, there. <laughs> and then as you do that, it helps you begin to see life in a different way. It gets you in the mood. It loosens things up just a bit. And so it's easier to move into that consciousness. I can see you like tip five. Uh, tip six. And this is the most practical, and that is set a reminder. Uh, maybe every time you, you come to the stoplight, you're going to pause and imagine you put on spiritual eyes and you look around and just imagine life that way. Maybe every time you stand up or every time you sit down or every time you go to bed or whatever you happen to be doing. You do those things and you shift just a bit. And you can do it just like that, just with the thought. And tip number seven, maybe you could find a spiritual-eyed friend. And you could both be doing the same thing and you could share your ideas and share how it's working in your life. That could be a big help, actually, sharing those kinds of insights. And so what do you see? What do you see when you look at the world? Do you see how it's really up to you? I know we like to blame everything that's external, but it's all within us. That's where the real choice is made. We want to see a world of peace. We want to see a world of love. We want to see a world of justice. Justice. And the real power begins when you begin to see through the eyes of another. We've been so stuck inside of our own heads. And because of that, there's violence and hatred and things that we can barely think about. All of us live in a different world. All of us have different thoughts. All of us have different beliefs. Even those of us who come here every Sunday, we have different thoughts and different beliefs. It's true. And sometimes we wonder, where's the real spiritual power? And I'm telling you, the real spiritual power be will begin and begins in your life once you begin to step out of yourself. Sometimes we, we've worked so hard on ourselves and we remain inside. And real power isn't found there. Real power flows from within, but only when you step out and you look through the eyes of another. And then you know what you do? You look through the eyes of another. And then you look through the eyes of another. And then you look through the, through the eyes of the whole world. That's where the power is. When we see through the eyes of another person, it stops conflict. It stops it. There'll be no school shootings if we do that. There'll be no shootings at all if we do that. It's an internal kind of thing we do. When we look through the eyes of others, it stops conflict. When we look through the eyes of another, it creates compassion. When we look through the eyes of another, it creates understanding. When we look through the eyes of another, it creates love. It's what empowered Jesus when he came on a man that had leprosy and everybody else ran. And he ran too, but he ran to the man and wrapped his arms around him and embraced him. And the Bible says healing took place because healing always takes place when you see through the eyes of another person. There may be certain people that you would shy away from. All of us have those people. You could probably, if you were honest, could make a list of the people that you might feel a little uncomfortable around. You might not want to embrace them. You might want to move back just a little bit. We put distance between us and people. And one way we do that is we label them. We take a nice name, often, 
Uh, if you want to look up sin in the Bible, there's a long list of things listed in every religion, I suppose. And you could take one of those and just stamp it on somebody's head. And what that means is you no longer have to deal with them. They're not a person anymore. They're not really human. That's a harlot. That's a drunk. That's, and we go down the list. And once we label someone, we don't have to deal with them anymore. It's the very opposite of seeing life through their eyes. It's dehumanizing. I was reading through the Gospel of John because I just read stuff. And I'm reading through there and I noticed every chapter just about dealt with people and Jesus. And he would meet different people in each chapter. And it was so interesting because other people would be with him, like the disciples, uh, the religious people of the day, uh, just people who lived in the area. And they would label those people. They would label them. And it was interesting to see how Jesus would change the label. They were labeling people, pushing them away. For example, there was a, a woman in... John chapter 8, and she was called in adultery, they said. And the man, of course, wasn't there, but the woman was there. And so she clearly had the stamp on her head that said, I'm an adulterer. And what that means is they no longer have to deal with her. They picked up stones and they were going to kill her. We kill people too. We kill people with our words. We kill people when we place labels on them. We kill people when we push them away. It's the very opposite of seeing life through their eyes. In John chapter 4, Jesus was standing by a well. A woman came, and she was a Samaritan. We Jews in that first century didn't talk to Samaritans. They were not exactly the right kind of people. And besides, she's a woman. A Jewish gentleman is not going to be talking to a woman. And so he was standing there alone, and she came to draw water. The disciples had gone into town to get some food, and they came back. And they said, oh my God, he's talking to a woman. What's wrong with him? And then as they got closer, they said, she's a Samaritan woman. And they said to him, you're talking to a Samaritan woman. And in the original language, they said something I, I figured like, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> and Jesus said, oh, I, I'm glad you pointed that out because I thought she was a human being. We label and we push people away. We dehumanize. We place them in categories. We do it in family sometimes. The man who said, oh, that's no lady. That's my wife. <laughs> do you get it? Yeah. it that's uh, not a, a man. That's my son. Or that's not a real woman. That's my daughter. Sometimes we do that in families. And we don't see the real person. We want to drop the labels. We want to step into the lives of people and be able to see from the inside out. We want to be able to see through the eyes of people. If we do that, there'll be understanding. If we do that, there'll be compassion. If we do that, there'll be no violence. There'll be no violence. And so we want to listen. We want to, we want to play the namaste game. We want to see the divinity in them as they see the divinity in us. We want to walk in their shoes. We want to see through their eyes. Ernest Holmes was, I think, a great man. Way beyond his time, in a sense. In 1945, he said that women could uh, become licensed and ordained as ministers. And you think, well, that's not that big a deal. But in 1945, and you're looking at all the religions of the day, it was an important thing to be saying. In his center in L.A., where he spoke most of the time, or a lot of the time, in the Science of Mind magazine, his center was listed at the top. A number of African Americans were attending. I don't know who made the decision, but someone made the decision to change the listing in the magazine. And so they put the L.A. Center at the bottom and put over it colored. We're in 1945 now. And he responded to that. Listen to what he says. I have been told too many non-Caucasians attend these lectures. True, there are Caucasians and non-Caucasians in this congregation. 
But this we must affirm. We are all children of the one living God. One life that permeates all without exception. One intelligence that governs all. And most important, every man and every woman who abides in the universe is a significant entity in the one universal consciousness. Our doors will be forever open to all. You are a divine idea in the mind of God. That's beautiful. I love him for saying that. That was 1945. We must stand for people. It's not enough just to meditate. It's not just enough to say a prayer. We must stand for people. We must do something at times. Equality. Marriage equality. Removing a flag that is offensive because of what it means. Even a decision regarding what bathroom can be used. How silly sometimes people can be. Even when I look through their eyes. It's fairness. It's called equality. It's called justice for all. Justice means in the right relationship with. Our vision is a world that's more whole. Equality. Compassion. Compassion is abused in our language because we often think of compassion as just pity. But pity, pity places me here and the other person down here. That's not what compassion means. The word means suffering with someone. And there are lots of people suffering. Suffering with. Someone who's here came up and talked to me uh, after the service started. And she said this. She said she was thinking about the world and of course she was thinking about suffering. And she said she just had the inspired idea to maybe call people that she knew and just to say, I'm calling because there's so much suffering. And I want you to know that I love you. And maybe you can pass this along. You can pay it forward. That's a beautiful idea. Because it can cover all the states and it can go beyond the states and it can cover the whole world. Things begin like that with just one person doing something. Compassion means embracing. Compassion for the children. Compassion for people who have a hard time walking down the street and being safe. Compassion for people who sometimes have a hard time driving down the road and feeling safe. Compassion for those in prison. Those people wouldn't be on your list, would they? Of people you want to stay away from or distance? I don't think so. And so we want to destroy that list so that we can move closer to everyone. Those who are suffering, those in substandard housing, those who are hungry, those who are homeless. Joseph Campbell, when he spoke to Bill Moyers, and I've seen the lecture many times, he defined compassion like this. He said, it's a natural opening of the human heart to another person. The Buddhist nun Pima Children said, Compassion is having a tenderness toward all of life. But I want to tell you, as one from Harlan, Kentucky, it means you have to get your hands dirty. It means sometimes you have to be in the mud. And you're in the mud because that's where pain is. That's where the suffering is. And that's where you want to be as divinity. Exactly where divinity would be. A Lakota woman, a few years ago, was invited to a, a huge Thanksgiving dinner. And she came. She wanted to be close to these people. She wanted to express her appreciation. So she came. But once she was there, she said, I will not be able to eat today because I'm fasting. And they said, how could you be fasting on Thanksgiving? And she said, I've just heard from someone that's very close to me that has firsthand knowledge of a famine in Africa. And it breaks my heart. I must do something for them, but I have no money. I don't have very much. I couldn't give enough to dent the famine, but I have decided to fast with them. They ask, well, why, why would you do that? And she said, and I quote, because at least I can share their suffering. You see, she was seeing through their eyes. 
among the tribes of northern Natal and South Africa. They don't, when they greet one another, say hello. They say, Sawabona. Sawabona. I listened last night to a number of people on YouTube say that, and it means, I see you. And if you were in that area and you responded, you would say, Sikhona. And that means, I am here. The order is important. First, I see you, and then the person responds, I am here. It's as if when you see me, you bring me into existence. This is part of the philosophy of the Zulu people, which I find very interesting. And they say, we don't become real until we are with others until we're with other people. Reminds me of the old TV show, Cheers, and the song that said, you want to be where everybody knows your name. So if I say to you, see me, can you feel the intensity of that? See me. And I say to you, I see you. And then we say, I am here. We are to be fully present with people. Fully present. That means we must see through their eyes. Everybody you know is saying the same damn thing. See me. That's what every child is saying. That's what every person, elderly person, says. See me. And everybody in the middle see me. That's what we're all saying. And so when you see the world, what do you see? When you see people, what do you see? When you see life, what do you see? Do you see the magic? She said, look, do you see that big bird? And that's the key. Look. God, there's so much beauty. Look. So will Bona. I see you. Let's pray. We set an intention to increase our vision. We set an intention to see more. We set an intention to see with divine eyes, spiritual eyes. It is our choice. It is our creation. It is our thoughts that we can choose. We come out of any box. We come out of any constraint, no longer in a straitjacket. And we stand strong. And everybody we see, nobody's off limits. Nobody is off limits. We may call someone and say, I love you. We see someone and we say, I love you. We say, I see you. Nothing can be more beautiful than that. Nothing can be more beautiful than that. Namaste. Divinity seeing divinity. And so we, as a community, we open our minds, we open our hearts. And maybe we make a personal commitment. Each day I'm going to choose what I see. Each day I'm going to choose the highest consciousness that I can presently imagine. And for that we are thankful and as a community we say together, So it is. Thank you.